Hey there, UMSL Student Life. My name is Elizabeth Eichmann, the former interim coordinator of the Gender Studies program and adjunct instructor and in UMSL alumna. I'm so thrilled to be here today, but you might be thinking something is different. And yes, uh, just for this final episode, the final episode of the season, I'm taking over Rainbow Talks as guest host. And uh, as you likely know by now, Harry Hawkins, the UMSL LGBTQ plus coordinator, has accepted the position of assistant director at Case Western Reserve University's LGBTQ Center in Cleveland, Ohio, and will be leaving UMSL at the end of September. So as a final hurrah, we decided to turn the tables a bit and invite Harry to be our final Rainbow Talks guest. I'm so excited to talk to Harry today, uh, to get to know him just a little bit more, to reminisce over his time at UMSL, and importantly, to wish him the very best as he starts the next chapter of his life in Ohio. Welcome, Harry. Hello, hello. Glad to glad to be here. I mean, you know, I'm just in a, I'm in the same seat, same spot. Uh, just the tables have been turned a little bit, so yeah, this will be fun. Awesome. I'm so excited. Um, yeah. So tell us about your summer. How was it? How have you been? Well, the first thing I'm thinking about, too, is it's almost like serendipitous in a way that, you know, you were the first guest on Rainbow Talk. So now it's like it has a perfect ending to where now yes. the tables have turned and now the guest is the host. <laughs> the tables have been turned on the host. Or the alpha um, and the omega of the right. series. That's right. So <laughs> how's my summer been? I mean, it's been... I think similar to everyone else's, there really was no summer. I mean, you watch summer from the inside of your house uh, for the most part. Uh, my mom makes fun of me, at least in pictures, and says, like, I'm so light right now. Like, this is the lightest I've been in years. Uh, I have really, like, no sun uh, as far as that goes. I've been staying inside. And, you know, I've been a lot more cautious maybe than other folks have. Um, so I really limit how much I go outside. And, you know, interact with things. But yeah, it's just been a summer that uh, wasn't really there. However, at least on the, the OMSL side of things, we, we stuck right through it. It was not a quiet summer because I think people who work at universities look forward to that period to kind of have some downtime. But that, that did not happen this year. We were steadily going. I was recording plenty of videos of me making bacon sandwiches and <laughs> doing Rainbow Talks episodes. And uh, it's it's been very busy. Uh, but the good thing is, it seems like at the end of August, being a big baseball fan that I am, we did get baseball back. That's still ongoing. But um, that helped a little bit because it was rough there for a bit. I was running out of things to watch on TV. I was like, okay, I've kind of gone through my reserves of on-demand things to watch. I need like actual new content <laughs> coming out. And so having baseball back and they play virtual, well, <laughs> it's fun, weird to say virtually now, but they play pretty much every day now. So, I mean, there, there's a game on every day. There's a game on the day. So I, I, it's filled that void, but it's, yeah, it's, it's like the summer. We'll look back and say 2020 was a summer that wasn't, it just didn't it wasn't a thing. We didn't really do anything uh, as far as that goes. But I was blessed to be able to go to Australia back in January um, before, you know, the pandemic hit. So at least I feel like I got a trip in. But yeah, just weird summer overall. So weird. Did you get one of the cardboard cutouts that they set up in the stadium? <laughs> <Have> <laughs> you seen no. So, I mean, for folks who don't know, and, uh, you know, I'm probably going to get a lot of uh, unlikes on the video now, but, um, you know, I, I am a Yankees fan. Uh, big, yeah, I'm a big Yankees fan, and uh, they're playing better now. They were not playing better last week, but um, play much better right now. And the Yankees are actually not doing those. They, they oh. I know, they didn't. They didn't do them. Um, you know, the Mets, the the bums from Brooklyn over there, uh, they they were doing it, and it's adorable because people have, like, their pets on there, and, yeah, and random people. Some people have really uploaded, like, a bunch of random folks. So I just feel like that was kind of a missed opportunity, Yankees, um, mm -hmm. because, yeah, I would have totally have done the cardboard cutout um, sitting there. Um, and I was actually supposed to go – 
um, to a couple of Yankees games this year. Uh, believe it or not, yeah, I was supposed to go up to the Bronx and catch a couple games. And then um, for those folks in St. Louis, uh, the Yankees were supposed to play the Cardinals this year just down the street at Bush Stadium, and y'all were going to lose those games. But um, it, it was it, – that was the thing, and I was so excited about it all winter because I was like, oh, my gosh, the – you know, it was like two weeks after Fourth of July. Yankees are coming to St. Louis. I'm gonna. I got really good seats. I was gonna be there. One of the games was an ESPN Sunday night game. I was just so excited to be there for all three games. And then COVID, it just it didn't happen. But you know, the nice thing is everyone got refunded. So it's all good. Yes, and we can look forward to all the things that we miss next year because. Everything, most things, a lot of things are getting rescheduled. So yeah. that's good. That's good. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, we'll be able to enjoy all of it from Ohio. So, yeah. I mean, that's the thing is Cleveland is an American League team, or, you know, Cleveland Indians are an American League team, and uh, the Yankees play in the American League, and they come to Cleveland multiple times a year. So I'll be able to see them much more regularly than I would here when they only play the Cardinals like every four years. So yeah. 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 Yay. Okay. So for those who never got the chance to like really ask you while you're at UMSL, I want to get to know Harry a little bit more. So tell us where were you born and raised? Tell us about your childhood. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, this is always a, a really fun uh, topic. It, it's a, it's a, my favorite thing that I like to do to local Uber drivers um, as I play this game of, they, they always ask me, granted though, I've taken so many Ubers here now that now have like my regular folks that I know. So they know me by now. But um, whenever I get a new Uber driver, it's like one of, if not the first, it's the second question of they go, where are you from? Um, and my favorite game to play with them is I normally say Canada and then I just keep it going. I just keep it going. And they're like, really Canada? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm from Toronto. I'm good friends with Drake. eh?" Um, and I just keep it going, you know, (laughs) just, (laughs) but but as far as the question, the real answer as I get around to it is I go, I'm from Mississippi. Um, I was born in a, a little old town just south of Vicksburg, Mississippi, which many of you who are history buffs will know that was a, a big Civil War battle um, that uh, happened there. And one of the, probably one of the most decisive next to like Gettysburg and places like that, one of the most decisive Civil War battles because it was control of the river, the Mississippi River, which flows out here. Um, and I've always joked and said, like, I could easily, if they had boat service down the river, I could just go home much quicker than getting in the car. Well, I don't know if it'd be quicker, but I could, you know, just get on, get on a paddle boat and just go home. Um, but yeah, I was born in a small town outside of Vicksburg called Port Gibson, um, that has its own little story is that, uh, Ulysses S. Grant, you may have heard of him, uh, was a famous uh, Union general, and when he was doing his march through Mississippi, and him and General Sherman, you know, were burning everything in sight, and got to Port Gibson, and he said the town was too beautiful to burn, so it's the slogan of the town. Um, the town was the town was not raised. It was one of the only, I think, in Mississippi that wasn't just you know burned to the ground. So. Um, yeah, that's, that's where I grew up, really small town, but most of the time being so close to, to Vicksburg, um, you know, it, it's, I'm trying to think of like, for people in St. Louis, what's a good way to describe like the distance, I'd be, I guess it would be like from downtown to Winsville, like that's how far it was away. Um, so I went to school, I did all of my things in Vicksburg. So a lot of times I say Vicksburg is really like, my my other hometown is I grew up had friends there went to school you know went to Catholic school there did all of those things um in Vicksburg so it's in a way it's almost like I have two hometowns but yeah born in Port Gibson raised in Mississippi that's where the uh the accent comes from that's also another fun game that other you know southerners who may be watching this is that we like to play with people who are not from the south is make you guess which state we're from and the accents are very distinct because I tell people all the time, I can hear differences. I can't, um, my accent and someone from, you know, Alabama, they're, they're very, their differences there. I can pick them up. 
um, and I can immediately tell. And, and that's a game I like to play um, when I know other Southerners are in the room as I come up and I'll be like, talk to me. Um, and I like to <laughs> guess. And I'm pretty good. I have figured it out. But um, if any of you are curious about this and you're just like, okay, Harry, I, you have no idea what you're talking about with this topic, look up uh, Fred Armisen, who some of you might know from Saturday Night Live or Portlandia. He studies accents and he talks about how there are different accents across states and he can do them on the fly. So get on YouTube, type in Fred Armisen doing accents. He does them on the fly. He even does like cities. He's like some cities within states have different accents. So that's like his big area of study. Um, but yeah, it's it's a thing. Southerners, we can hear it. I, I can tell. Um, where yeah, I would imagine that playing that game with Midwesterners, <laughs> well, we probably would just all say Alabama. I mean, I don't know. That's what I would do. I, you know, it's, and I say this, so that there's a colleague of mine at UMSL uh, who is from Alabama, Laura Holt. Some of y'all might know she's from Alabama. And, and when we do safe zone trainings together, we talk about this dynamic. But um, also, too, there's a thing with language. Y'all are getting like a real lesson on linguistics and language today. But there's a thing with language when you're like away um, from that environment, your your accent disappears over time. And that's why you hear like kids who describe themselves as, like military brats, like they don't have a very distinct accent because they're like, I moved my entire life. And I, I've had some people from back home say that my accent has started to disappear a little bit and I'm talking a little bit faster than, and I'm like, yeah, I've been out of the South and working away from the South for a while now. But no, when I get home, give me about two weeks and like a lot of, uh, you know, good food. I slow down. I start, you know, taking my time and answering those questions very slow. But, uh, you know, it comes, it, that actually was a Georgia accent. I don't know where that came from, but I sounded like Jimmy Carter there for a second. But um, it's, yeah, it, it comes back. But it's, yeah, that would be a, a fun game to play with Midwesterners. And um, yeah, it, it's, it's interesting. But no, not Alabama, not Alabama at all. I don't, they talk a little bit slower um compared with mississippi so no i can i can tell you i'm not i don't have that accent so mm -mm. so share with us some of your earliest memories of the lgbtq plus community yeah uh this one of my memories that i have was i um was raised Episcopalian. Um, that's, you know, the faith that I was raised in. And um, there was a lesbian couple and that they, I don't know if they ever married. That's why I'm like kind of navigating the story. I'm like, were they ever married? I don't know. Um, we'll say they were. Um, and there was a lesbian couple in town and this was in Port Gibson, the small town. And I remember they attended church. One of them sang in the choir. The other one did the yard work for the church and did general maintenance. Like that was what they did. And I remember they would always go home together and I would see them in church holding hands. And I mean, y'all, this was like the mid nineties when this was going on. And me being young, I had to be like six or seven. I just was like, oh, well, that's kind of cool. And I asked my mom about it. I was like, mom, why, why do why are they doing that? And she was like, because they love each other very much. And I was like, oh, are they together? And she's like, I think, yeah, they live together. They're a couple. And that was really my first memories of it. I've been very fortunate, especially when we talk about issues of like LGBTQ people in the church and like faith. Um, that's a very, a touchy is not the word, but that's a very hurtful topic for a lot of LGBTQ people who have had hate preached at them. Um, about, you know, their identity and their things like that. And so for me, I have said I was very, very lucky and fortunate that I was raised Episcopalian. I never heard hate on Sundays. Um, I always heard good things. And, um, and even that's a great instance of that. It was like, yeah, they were accepted in our church in the mid nineties. And it wasn't even, I mean, it might've been, you know, there could have been some hush hush around the town, but it was never anything just overt. And, and so I think that was really um, my first memories of it. And, and something that has recently come back to light. So now you get like a part two of this answer um, is my cousin um, who is an author 
and he and I have had the chance to to reconnect uh, a lot over this time. We're we're separated in age by a couple decades, so we you know we grew up at different times. We view and it's so fascinating. Like when you have family members, cousins, or siblings even who are like big generations or, or decades apart they have different stories and different contexts of seeing like your parents, your aunts, your uncles, and you hear these different things that like, I didn't know because either I wasn't there. Or I was not, you know, I was in the universe. So I was not a being yet, or I was too young. And so, you know, talking to Chris and he's done a couple of podcasts and interviews down in Miami. He lives the fabulous life in Miami now. Um, but I had a chance to go back and listen to them and he was recounting our family stories. And I always say it's just unique to a read literature where your cousin is writing stories that are about your family (laughs) and you, and you have that, Oh, I know what you're talking about, or I know exactly who this character is based on. And then it's another thing too. Like when you listen to an interview and you hear him, recounting these stories about my family when I was a kid and talking about these things that happened. And I'm like, Oh, I remember that. And and so those of you are probably thinking, okay, why did Harry bring up the story? The reason I bring this up is that Chris um, came out as gay around that time in the mid nineties. And he was engaged. I, I remember this. He was engaged to a woman they were getting married and, you know, me being like four or five years old, you know, you just hear it and you're just like, oh, yay. You know? <laughs> you're just happy. Like, oh, marriage. Yay. <laughs> and I guess that should be your reaction now, maybe. But uh, uh, so I heard it. And then I remember this very abrupt, we didn't talk about it. And when you're a kid, you can't conceptualize that. You don't, you can't get the context of why we're not talking about this. As I got older, I found out what happened was he came out, the engagement ended, my aunt and uncle shunned him. Um, But my mom and my dad did not, because I remember they still kept in contact and things. And so hearing him tell this story now, and that interview was last year, and I am 31 now, uh, hearing that it was just surreal, but also like enlightening. And I don't know how many people have the opportunity to have that, to hear like your family stories told from different angles Mm -hmm. and to go back and hear that. And so I think that was really my second I guess in the timeline, it might've been my first because I think like the, the folks at church that I was a little bit older, but I think that was a, another instance of my first, you know, knowledge of the LGBTQ community, but I don't think it was very strong because I wasn't quite sure of what was going on, but I found out later and it was just, it, when I found out it was so heartbreaking, especially when I was a teenager, like really gripping with that and being like, wow, that really did happen. Even though I was a kid, like there's nothing I could have done. Um, but my mom was always steadfast. There still is um, for him. And, you know, our side of the family has always been very steadfast. And then you have me. So <laughs> that's just, you know, the added bonus. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's it's interesting. Would you share with us as much as you're comfortable yeah. your own experiences with coming out? I mean, I go back to, um, you know, before I was here at UMSL, I worked for the Human Rights Campaign, um, which is the largest LGBTQ nonprofit uh, in the United States. And we would always talk about our coming out stories. And uh, part of my job at the time was going around in Mississippi and meeting LGBTQ folks across the state. I always used to say my my constituency was the entire state. And I would hear coming out stories that were beautiful, but every rose has a thorn. And I would hear ones that were absolutely pain, just awful things. And my own coming out story, I just go back and say, I was blessed um, to have, you know, a mom um, that this just was not, it was never a thing. And I mean, the background on it and the other question that I get asked by everyone outside of my voice is like, well, where, where are you from? 
you don't look like you're from Mississippi. And I tell people that, well, I'm a mixed race person. And that's a big part of my identity outside of my sexuality is my mom is, you know, I'm first generation American in some aspects because my mom was born in Thailand. She came over in the seventies. Um, so yeah, I'm like the first one in some regards. And so, um, my mom was raised Buddhist. And so that has an effect on really your upbringing, your values, your ethics, your morals. So for her LGBTQ, it's just like, who cares? Like it's, it's not, it's not a thing. My mom, of course, um, converted to Christianity and she's Episcopalian now, very big Episcopalian. Um, but she still retains a lot of those core values, those core tenets of Buddhism. And I, I, it's kind of, as I've grown older, older and wanted to reconnect with my own heritage, I have kind of drifted a little bit closer to, to Buddhism in some aspects, but it's, yeah, it just never, that's, that was never a problem. I was blessed. I came out at 16. It was the most anticlimactic <laughs> coming out um, you could really think of. Um, my mom, in her true fashion, was just like, well, yeah, I knew because you asked for Elton John's greatest hits for Christmas last year. <laughs> so, that's a great album, by the way. A great album, if you haven't heard it. Um, that that white album, fantastic. Uh, I actually have it on iTunes now. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you know, it was just anticlimactic, and it was not anything. I was just told that it doesn't matter and um good experiences and had good experiences in high school too because as i said i i went to a catholic school and you know that might not be the best um but teachers and everyone coaches people were very supportive of me and so i got lucky but i the other half of coming out stories as i say my story is actually abnormal um, and that's sad um, that my, my story is not the norm. However, I think times are changing and I think my story is becoming more norm where it's like, yeah, but for people of our age, um, that's not normal. Um, there's, there's just bad, bad stories of people being kicked out and, and discriminated against and things like that. But I was very fortunate. So we learned a little bit about, um, you know, sort of your experience in the LGBTQ plus community oh. in small town Mississippi. So you've been in St. Louis the past three years. So how would you describe the LGBTQ plus community here? What has your been? What has your experience here been like? Oh wow bigger. I mean, there's more people. <laughs> so, Mississippi LGBTQ community. I'm like, you know, we might as uh, at times I used to jokingly say someone's got a phone tree somewhere. Um, <laughs> because everybody knows every, like the, the, like the country song goes, everybody knows everybody. Um, so it's, uh, it kind of, it goes that way. It's a much smaller community and it's always the fun game, especially if you're a Southerner is finding out how many degrees of separation you have, where it's like, Oh, I know your cousin or your mama or somebody like that. It happens. Put two, two, two Mississippians in a room, go find me one. We'll figure this out. Like we'll, we'll find out how I know you um, in some regards. So it's uh, the St. Louis LGBTQ community is much larger um, resources are here. You know, you have multiple organizations now that have spaces. I mean, that's a big thing. And that was a big part of my work in Mississippi with HRC was that part of that whole initiative, which is Project One America, and it's still ongoing, go check it out, but um, was that when you look at the LGBTQ movement and resources that have been dedicated to regions, to move us forward in the, in this regard and in this context, the South has been left out. It was just, there was no money invested. It was left up to the people there. And it was always the opinion. And you heard this a lot from some of our LGBTQ folks on the, on the coast. Why don't you just move? Well, um, <laughs> it's quite privileged to be able to just, up and move. And I don't think it's acceptable that we're going to let the rest of our country just continue to not 
move forward and your only option is to move what if they love their town what if they love their neighbors what if you know there's a myriad of reasons of like why that's not an appropriate response so part of that initiative was to really get money and resources there and i went to a lot of our towns like our larger towns which for mississippi they'll call cities but um, for the larger towns and to meet with local LGBTQ folks who were doing the work, who were basically organizations without their 501c3 status. Mm -hmm. And I can say that when I left, there was at least three to four organizations, two of them had started brick and mortar status. So they were, they actually had a space and they had their C3 status, which is huge. Um, so the needles move forward. So when I come to St. Louis, it was just like, well, yeah, I mean, they have, they, they have all this stuff. Um, they have everything in place. Um, however, though, there's a lot of the isms that affect our community, especially with racism and classism, are prevalent everywhere. And they're prevalent in St. Louis. I'm sorry, St. Louis, if you don't think it's here, it's here. Um, it's very much prevalent, and, and I have witnessed some of that in some regard. Um, but the thing about, and this is St. Louis broadly, if I like pull back the lens from LGBTQ, St. Louis is really kind of like a little big city. It's kind of got the small town mentality of everybody knows everybody. I mean, you ask me where I go to, where did I go to high school? So <laughs> that's always, the, so that's always kind of flipped me around a little bit where coming from the South, coming from where that's kind of expected in some regard, better or for worse. Mm. Um, so my, I, my, my brain is like, oh, that's not going to be the thing in St. Louis. They're not going to care, you know, where you're from. Oh, no. It, <laughs> so it threw me off. That took some adjustment of being like, oh, oh, okay, this is more small, small town than I was maybe expecting because I did work part time out of D.C. as well. So, I mean, that's that's a whole different thing. So it, it's yeah, the community here, it, it's larger. It's got the resources. It's got things. I think there is more to do. There's always more to do. Um, but I think you're seeing those issues of racism and classism in the community, and that's affecting the LGBTQ community across the country. And I think St. Louis is continuing to wrestle with those questions and those conversations. Um, and in some regard, I think St. Louis is, has been, at least with Black Lives Matter, has led the way, I mean, started here, um, leading the way in those conversations. And so I think the LGBTQ community here is on the forefront of, of dealing with those things. And I look forward even from a distance, uh, soon to be from a distance, kind of seeing how St. Louis keeps moving the conversation on race forward um, in America that we need to have. So for the last three years, you served as LGBTQ plus coordinator at UMSOL and you've guided the office of LGBTQ plus initiatives from its beginning as brand new yep. through a number of transitions and <laughs> to where it is now um, as a division of student affairs. So I was wondering if you would just tell us a little bit more about that history. How far has the office come in just three short years? What are some of the major moves and accomplishments? Yeah, you know, it um, started students, our LGBTQ students on campus saw that there were a lot of things when it came to LGBTQ folks on our campus that were just being left out or falling through the cracks. And they demanded action from the administration at the time. Um, and so this position was created. And so I think that really goes to the spirit of our campus and our students, uh, especially of, of when there are any type of inequities like that, they, they speak up, um, especially our students. And, and so having this position created uh, over these three years, it has been a journey as far as that goes. I say, and you know, I consistently say this, is that UMSL, when I came in, best practices were there. UMSL was really doing the right things. UMSL has been taking part in the Campus Pride Index, which is a nationwide assessment of colleges and universities and how well they do with LGBTQ populations on their campus. Go check it out if you want more information on it. But um, UMSL had a three and a half out of five score, which is good. You know, it's just in the middle. You could be better, but it's good. And a lot of those essential core best practices in that three and a half score were there and um, much further ahead. And so the climate was good. You know, it wasn't like I was coming into a situation like maybe I would in Mississippi or, 
or something like that. Granted, in fairness, uh, the universities in Mississippi do a good job on LGBTQ too, but uh, which is maybe a testament to higher ed broadly. But um, yeah, I mean, the best practices were there. It was more or less, I, I think back to my first year, it was just going through and finding out who does what, what's being offered, finding out that there was an LGBTQ book club in the College of Education that had been going on. I mean, there were just all these scattered things going on and they were great, but it was taking that and saying, okay, I'm here now. How can we pull this all together and have it in a way that we can easily present it to students, um, prospective faculty and staff, current faculty and staff, and then also the greater St. Louis community? Because it's it's been a big piece of my three years here and, and doing this program, Rainbow Talks, is saying that, you know, a unique thing if you're watching this from outside of St. Louis to know is that there's only two uh, really only two four-year public um, universities in St. Louis. The rest of them are private. And so there's us in Harris Stowe, which is a historically black college university or an HBCU. And I think our place as UMSL being a public institution, having an LGBTQ program, I have pushed and pushed and said, we must lean into this. You got to lean into this. It's a big thing to be the public institution in the city. And for LGBTQ folks to know that and to say, you know, I can go to OMSL, they have an LGBTQ program, it's a public institution, it's a big deal. Um, and so that's been a big part of those three years of leaning into that, promoting it, saying we have this. And, and you know, I've seen that and of course doing this program has helped as well. But um, the small things, too, well, I say small things, they're huge things. It's It's having annual lavender graduation programs, having, you know, LGBTQ History Month um, every year, which they were doing before I got there, but having, you know, me there to actually coordinate and, and get them uh, moving and things. The university has, has come a long way in three years, and I, I think that um, for me, it's always you never leave anything worse than you found it. Like, <laughs> Don't wreck the car and then just hand, or, you know, as a valet driver, don't wreck the car and just bring the keys and maybe like a lug nut back or something. And this is all I could recover. <laughs> it's what I'm not trying to do um, here at Umsel is that I think it's, it's this program um, is in a good place. It has a good foundation. It's made it through its infancy stage. And I think it is time to move to the next stage. And I'm excited with, um, you know, at some point a new person coming in and taking it to the next stage. It's there. It's ready for growth. Um, it's, I remember my interview at Onzel as I talked about being at, you know, HRC and going to Mississippi and starting that's, you know, helping start that statewide program. I used to joke and I just said it was like they dropped me off at the edge of the jungle gave me a backpack and a machete and said, see on the other side or not. Um, <laughs> and so I have a history of doing that in my career. And so coming to Umsel, it was similar in some regards, maybe, maybe more of like I had an RV, maybe not so much a machete and a backpack, but I had an RV and a trail and it was, um, you know, establish this program, get a foundation going, and having those best practices that Umsel is already doing in place made that much easier um, to do, but I think it's it's at a new phase. I think it's getting into that, I don't know where are we at, I said infancy, so it's almost like that, uh, okay, you're starting elementary school, or maybe you're getting to middle school, or however, you can jump ahead in years, and it's, it's time for a, a new building, uh, what is it, when you go to junior high, you go to a new building, you get a new set of teachers, a whole new thing, so I think that's the phase where the program's in. I've helped it through elementary school, uh, turning the keys over to someone else in the next phase. Yeah. So what are your, like, your hopes and dreams for this next phase? Like, you know, you mentioned going to Ohio and being able to watch St. Louis from afar. So what do you hope, um, you know, develops or, or happens with the, with the program? in your departure as it works its way through the awkward middle school years and oh. 
Oh yeah. So let's see. What what does it have to look forward to? Braces and <laughs> braces and breakouts and <laughs> breakups. <laughs> the triple B. Um, so uh, yeah, I think it's there's a lot of con conversations, but movement on our campus of of getting a cultural center set up. And, you know, I had the opportunity to be there at the table and be one of the co-chairs of the committee that put together a draft report for our cultural center. That's something else I did outside of hosting Rainbow Talks and making bacon sandwiches. And, and so, you know, knowing that that's there and there's movement on that now, and I think looking at logically where things fit, I think it's in that report, it's definitely in the people who are talking about it, is that LGBTQ programs will be a cornerstone of that center when it's set up. I think that's the natural evolution of middle school to high school. And um, that's what I'm looking at, is that I, I want to see that center open. It's going to. And then seeing LGBTQ programs part of that center, and that takes it to a whole nother level at that point, because I think, um, and right now, I'm, I'm thinking about this, it's like right now in this year, maybe a lot of us have underestimated how physical space means to us. What, what does physical space mean? Um, I think even I could be guilty of discounting it over the years. And so I would say what I mean by that is having a center um, or a space for LGBTQ faculty, staff, and students to come and to have events and to do different things, to have that sense of community on campus is huge. And it's not, it's an intangible, you can't measure that. And so I think 2020 has probably taught us how important having that space and being around others is. So I think when we come back into things, I think we're all gonna look at it differently and say, yeah, <laughs> we gotta get that space going. It's, yeah, we need to, we need to make that happen. So that to me, I, I think is the growth looking through the middle school age is, is getting that brick and mortar started. And, you know, I'll always advocate and, and it's what I'm going to um, at Case Western is that, you know, Case Western has a brick and mortar LGBTQ center. Many of our colleges and universities do. And I think that's a natural progression as well, because a lot of times LGBTQ programs start in cultural centers then they, you know, they leave high school and they go to college and they've outgrown and they need to be on their own. Now, see, you know, we got a good little metaphor going here. <laughs> so that, yeah, we did good on this. So like they've outgrown, they need to be on their own. And so at that point, I think LGBTQ centers, you see them become their own thing. And that's with other groups. You see that with black student centers or Latinx centers or even Asian Pacific Islander centers on campuses, women's centers. Um, I could go on and on and on they outgrow, but I think looking at UNSL, that middle stage is we got to get the cultural center set up to where our different groups can have their spaces, and then as they grow into those college years, then let's look at having the brick and mortar for an LGBTQ center. That to me is the dream that I look at for UNSL, and, and knowing that you got alumni that absolutely would support that and would be down for it, and having that space on campus. Um, I think that's that's where I look at things going is get the center going, then start looking at having an LGBTQ standalone mm -hmm. center somewhere on the campus. Got lots of space, lots of space to work with on the campus. So yeah, it's bright future. Yeah. So what's been your most rewarding part about working either as the coordinator or just at UMSL in general? What's the one thing that you'll look back fondly on five years from now. That's hard. <laughs> That's okay, hard. You can say two things. <laughs> okay, I can say two. Oh, two. <laughs> oh thanks. <laughs> but, um, wow. I look at, and this is a dynamic for me that I've talked about with at least one of my colleagues, incoming colleagues at Case, is that, you know, I've been to public university, um, attended Mississippi State University, Hell State, um, and, uh, you know, working here at UMSL and talking about earlier about how that identity of being the public institution in the city 
and the access that that provides and, and education and social mobility and UMSL ranks really high on that index and with LGBTQ people. And, and so wrapping my head around, that's always been a point of pride for me is to say that we're a public institution. We transform lives. Um, see, I got that in, I'm at my quota. Um, we transform lives and, you know, it's, it's gonna, that's important for me. So that's gonna change a little bit when I get a case because that's a private institution, but they clearly are doing fantastic things for Cleveland. And so I'm excited, and Ohio in general, so I'm very excited about that. But yeah, I mean, that's been a, a point of pride about, working at UMSL is knowing that access and knowing that you are transforming lives. And lately I've been saying uh, for those of us like graduating students and maybe faculty and staff, when we leave, we need to have our own hashtag of lives transformed um, mm -hmm. because our lives have been transformed forever. And then those that we've worked with, I hope I have transformed their lives and that's always been so important to me knowing that a student i heard this in my three years i don't say a lot but i heard it at times of students that you know were in high school or from rural parts of our state um that had never met other lgbtq people or had the opportunity to socialize or be somewhere that fully recognizes all of them and being that person it's huge. I mean, that's a, that's a big, that's an honor that I've had. Um, so I'll, well, I won't miss that. I'll still have that where I'm going, but it's, yeah, that's been a big part of being at UMSL, of knowing students. Many of our students are the first in their family to go to college. And, and so, and navigating that as well, you know, it's never helping them figure out that, yeah, you have to register for classes in spring. <laughs> That's always my fun conversation. It's like, yeah, you're, you know, you're not hanging out with me for an entire year. You have to go register for spring classes, but just those little things too. That's always just, it brings great joy. And I think those of us who work at UMSL can talk about that, of the joy that it brings and knowing that, you know, you're creating that access for somebody. Um, yeah. So. so what kind of advice um, do you have for our LGBTQ plus students. How do you think that our students can thrive both personally and professionally as out individuals? That dynamic is consistently, or not consistently, but it's, it's changing a lot this year. Um, I think immediately about, we had the Supreme Court ruling, back in June, um, I guess that was part of my summer, um, that was a surprise to us all that really changes the dynamics with LGBTQ people in the workplace and how huge, huge that ruling was. Um, and you know, it, it changes that, but also just knowing the environment and the climate that we're in right now, um, it's, it's, it's not great. And it's, it's a time where, it feels like all of the progress that we've made is being rolled back on the daily by the hour, really. And, and that's a hard thing. And I think that's hard for a lot of people in the community to reckon with on LGBTQ, but other things as well, is, is that it just feels like we're slowly going backwards. And I think existing and thriving right now um, and talking to LGBTQ folks in the community and, and just friends, I know it's almost like barely, barely doing that right now um, because it's, it's a very hard time. And I think it's, I think back to the phrase of a diamond is created under the greatest pressure. Yeah. So this time and this period I say is not great and, and it's a lot going on. and know that this, you know, as Annie would say, the sun comes out tomorrow, is that there, there will be an upside to all of this, that the diamond is going to be created. And that if you as an LGBTQ person watching this knows that, you know, under pressure, you're going to come out a beautiful, flawless diamond um, at the end of all of this and that you will make it through this and it is going to be tough. There are going to be rough days and we have had many of those this, you know, this year alone. Um, but you, you are a fabulous person and you will continue to be on the other side of this and you have to keep at it. 
um, so to speak, and don't let folks get you down and don't let folks define who you are or have to validate your existence. That's the, that's the biggest lesson I think I have learned is that I validate myself. Other people do not. Um, and so, yeah, it's a big lesson to learn. I love that. It's such a, it's, it's wonderful. So I'm going to just let those, um, the last thought sort of be, um, the end of our like formal interview. Um, but what I want to do for the last few minutes is staying on the topic of Umsol and St. Louis and Harry have like a, a little quick round of like fun, quick answer questions. So on your phone, round. Yes. I got it. Okay, are you ready? I, I think. <laughs> okay, get ready. Um, what's your favorite UMSL student event? Oh, gosh. <laughs> this is not no, very quick. <laughs> no, I, I know so much for lightning. It's like a slow moving, you know, <laughs> mud or something. Um, because I have so many that are my favorite. Okay, you know, one that I adore is I've been a judge of the lip sync battle during homecoming. Oh, yeah. Fun. I love it. I love it. That's just good. Yeah. Uh, St. Louis style food that the most. The so St. Louis style food that I'm going to miss the most. Um, yeah. See, this one's. <laughs> Lightning. I knew it would be tough because what? I don't think you like St. Louis style food. <laughs> well, she read me in the middle of the interview. But, but, uh, you know, here's the thing, and this is not lightning, this is slow moving mud again. It's okay. It's okay. Um, or as one as my best friend would say, I can hear him right now. He's like, You worked in politics so long that you answer like a politician. Just answer the question. I'm like, I can't help it, okay? Um, but they're genuine answers. Um this is the hard thing. When you're from the South, mm -hmm. we don't do a lot of things right. But the food, I, I will go toe-to-toe -to -toe on the food, is that our region's food is the best. It may not be the most healthy. I didn't say that. But, you you know, it's the best. And so it's, yeah, when I go to other places. I, but I'm a foodie, though. And I, I always find things that I'm like, I'm going to love. And the hard thing about it is that a lot of the, the restaurant scene in St. Louis people is outstanding. Mm -hmm. And a lot of things you have here, though, you can have in other places. It's just the cooks here and the chefs here do a damn good job of making it. It's, so then the restaurant you'll miss the most. How about I'll answer the St. Louis. I'll give you both of those. Okay. So okay. the St. Louis thing I think that I've been okay with is, okay, I'm all right with fried ravioli. It's much better in St. Louis than it is at like a random TGI Fridays yeah. in Ohio. Yeah. Um, so it's good here. It's pretty good. Also, I, over the summer, did finally have riplets. Um, interesting. Mm. Okay, interesting. The heartburn, not so much, but it was interesting. Um, <laughs> restaurant that I'm going to miss, yeah, you're getting me in trouble again because there's so many good ones, but I miss going to polite society. I'm going to miss that. Mm. If your childhood had a smell, what would it be? Oh, okay. Once again, slow moving mud. <laughs> My childhood had a smell. I used to get in trouble because I would occasionally try to eat Play Doh. Um, but <laughs> oh, I mean, but that's because it has a very distinct smell. So, yeah, that's good. I don't know if Play Doh is my answer, though, because I'm like, oh, I don't. Okay, sand. Sand. Because as a kid, I had a sandbox. My dad uh, loved building things. He was a carpenter and he, he was an engineer first, then a carpenter, but um, he made me a sandbox. And back in the day, for our younger folks who are maybe um, Gen Z and watching this, back in the day, millennials, they just put us outside. <laughs> and that was what they did. I didn't have any Nintendo or anything. They just put you outside and lock the door and you couldn't come in until lunchtime. So <laughs> my mom would just plop me in the sandbox and leave me out there all day. And I remember I consistently, it was like every day I had the same struggle of I was trying to dig to China. Um, I was determined I was going to get to China and never did, obviously. But um, sand, yeah, sand. I like that. Um, an UMSL memory that will like forever be stuck in your brain. 
Oh. Oh. There's a lot there. Wow. All the lavender graduation ceremonies that I ugly cry through. Um, Transgender Spectrum Conference, hosting that at UNSL. Um, for those who don't know, that's a regional conference that's uh, basically education, professional development, but it's also for the transgender community. And it's, it's a place for them to come together, like a homecoming in some regards, but it's, it's unique in the Midwest. And um, UNSL was started that conference and it rotates around. And so that conference came back to UNSL and I had only been at UNSL for like, four months at that point and it came back and then we hosted it the following year so I, I became chair pretty pretty soon and that high stress but high rewards but the memory of just all of that that entire weekend really and and our provost at the time who is now chancellor attending and speaking um Kristen Sobolik was there and yeah, just how much good energy was on our campus that whole weekend and seeing administrators, faculty, staff, students just popping by for the conference. It was, yeah, it was great. I mean, that's, yeah, it's hard to pick one because I'm like one of those people. I have lots of snapshot memories. That's a hard one for me. So, yeah. Uh, one place in St. Louis that you've always wanted to visit, but never did, and probably won't before you move. <laughs> Thanks, COVID. Um, yeah. I mean, that's why. Um, yeah, I actually have a bunch of these that would probably make St. Louisans, like, scream at me. They'll mm -hmm. yell at me as I cross the bridge. They'll just be like, get um, Yeah. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna cheat. I'm gonna do two because I just really want people in St. Louis's jaw to drop and say you never went there. Um, never went to City Museum. <laughs> it's three blocks. No, it's five blocks away. It's five blocks away. Never went. Also, never went to the botanical gardens. <laughs> I'm just gonna do the jaw drop for everyone. Oh my gosh. But I did go to the zoo. I live near Bush Stadium. I've been to cards games, never went to a blues game because I don't like the idea of it's cold outside and I go somewhere where it's cold inside. I don't like that. So sorry, that wasn't gonna happen. But yeah, I've done oh, and you know, I know I'm cheating, I'm doing a third one. Never went up in the arch. Never did it. I'm afraid of heights, though, so that's... I'm not going to let you answer anymore because I'm getting disappointed <laughs> more and more. <laughs> and now with 2020, I can't do them, so, yeah. Sorry. The perfect excuse, I guess. <laughs> yeah, sure. We'll go with that. Yeah. <laughs> the bravest or most daring thing you've ever done? Some people could say being LGBTQ and out in Mississippi, but I know there are many other people who do that every day and I think they're braver than I am. Um, I'll go with a fun one, or maybe not. Um, ate mystery meat in Thailand at one of the markets. Still don't know what that was, uh, but I just, being a foodie and I think of culture and hospitality, of course, hospitality is important for a Southerner, but, um, when someone offers you a sausage mystery meat from their stall and it's clearly a gesture of goodwill, welcome to my country and things like that, um, you eat it. <laughs> so, hate to break it to you, you're going to eat it. Um, yeah, I ate that and I just remember thinking, I don't know what that was. And I asked my mom and she even said, it's unlabeled, so you probably don't want to know. And I said, good. <laughs> Your favorite UMSL tradition? Oh. oh, wow. See, like, I feel like our new student programs, folks, the first thing that comes to my mind, I'm like, I don't know if we qualify that as an official 
official tradition. So like new student programs, please don't yell at me if I say this. So I'm going to give two answers. So the one that I'm not sure is an official UMSL tradition, but I would lobby hard in the week that I have left that it should be, is when we kick off Black History Month, we have the soul food celebration. And oh gosh, now I'm going to name three, but soul food celebration and for me, coming from the South, my first year in St. Louis, that was going into my six month here in, for the first Black History Month that I participated in on campus. I was homesick. I had not had Southern food. I didn't go home for the holidays. So that was my first opportunity in a long time. The sweet tea was perfect. Um, it was actually sweet. And everything was cooked so well. And I every year I looked forward to that. So people on campus who are watching this are, and know me are laughing right now. But those of you at home don't know that I was usually like the first or second person in line behind the chancellor. So I, I was there. I was like, you're not getting in front of me. Um, second one would definitely be the chili cook-off too. I love, 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 love. I love knew you were going to say that. <laughs> love, love, love the chili cook-off. It's normally freezing cold and snowy and that's a perfect thing. St. Louis, you do good on chili. I come from a region that chili is not appreciated. It's, just, it's too hot. Um, but the one that new student programs would say, okay, that might be an official tradition is I love serendipity send off at the beginning of the school year. I love, uh, we're exhausted all of us by the end of it and it's hot and we're outside, but it's just great that whole atmosphere. And I, and a lot of us missed that this year because it, it is really like a homecoming for all of us, because a lot of our faculty are gone in the summer and then staff, we may not see each other as much because our meetings and committees kind of slow down. And then we have like students, new students coming in. And so we have the big outdoor barbecue and it's just an umzel tradition and welcoming those new students, or I say the little goslings, the little geese um, to the family is just fun. It's, it's a lot of fun and I, I will absolutely miss that aspect of it. So. Weirdest thing about living in St. Louis or weirdest thing about St. Louis? <laughs> Never going to the Art City Museum and Botanical Gardens. <laughs> uh, weirdest, you know, this is almost like another Rainbow Talks of its own. St. Louis, I, and it's, I've deep dove into this because I'm a history buff um, and Elizabeth is a big history person. Um, but I wanted to understand the culture and the history of St. Louis and Missouri a lot better. And that's a whole nother talk, but Missouri, I think as a whole and St. Louis has it is, I don't know what you are in the sense of, are you a Southern state or are you a Midwestern state? I don't know what you are. I come from the South and I can tell you where, it, where you're checking your boxes, but then there are the other things that I'm like, Whoa, that's weird. I don't know where that comes from. So that's been the weirdest thing here is it's a cultural, it's, I have said, using the political colors term, I've said, culturally, this is a purple state. Culturally. Mm -hmm. Politically, different conversations, but culturally, purple. I don't know what the state or St. Louis is, but I think it's much more in touch with its French roots. And so for me, living back in Mississippi, having New Orleans as a weekend trip, you know, that's what you do. You go to New Orleans on the weekend. Um, so moving further away and not having that availability, we kind of sucked in a way. But when I got to St. Louis, St. Louis is much more in touch with its, well, not much more, uh, but it's very much in touch with its French roots. And I, I found that very comforting in a way. I called it, I was like, if you're doing French territory, St. Louis was like Montreal <laughs> for New Orleans, basically. So very kind of Canadian almost like, so yeah. What fictional place would you most like to visit? Fictional? Yeah. Oh, see, that's not fair because I'm a nonfiction reader. So <laughs> that's, that's a quirk about me. I read nonfiction. Oh, the first thing that comes to my mind, I'm like, well, is that, fic is that a fictional place or not? I don't know. Oof. Wow. I am really stuck on this one. Fictional place. Cause I read things that are grounded in reality. So it's like, Oh, <sighs> or you could say like place from history, like visit a place in oh. a 
historical moment. Okay, now that one I could definitely do much better than that one. Um, I love, 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 because I architecture is my fine art that I took it in college. So I, I love architecture and looking at things and like the art deco and streamline modern period, go look those up, um, is my favorite style and I love that period. So I'm thinking like golden age of Hollywood. Um, give me the time machine. I'll put on my fedora and my suit and I will disappear. I'll, I'll be hanging out at the Brown Derby. Um, yeah, I'll disappear. Like you could just leave me there. So yeah. Okay. Our last two quick questions are about Umsol. Okay. So the first one is what do you hope Umsol misses most about you? I, friendliness, I would hope, or casualness, I'm very much, and I, when I was at HRC, people talked about my way, especially, you know, working with politicians or, or any type of elected officials, I'm just much more casual. Um, I do observe formalities, people can tell you I, I am formal with some things, but when it comes to social interactions, I'm more casual. I pop in, say, how are you doing? Come into your office. I don't, that's what's been tough, I think, with, you know, this whole period is like, I can't do that. I can't just pop into someone's office, see how they're doing, talk for less than a minute, and then leave them alone. So, I mean, I... I hope they miss that, you know, me just bopping around campus. And I've had people say, like, how do you know this many people around campus? So I just got to know them by just seeing them every day and interacting with them. So I hope they miss that. Yeah. What you miss about Umsel the most? And what's something that I'll miss about Umsel the most? Was the question? Yeah. Oh, hmm. It's, it's just back around to that. I, you know, you really know everybody. People are approachable. It's small-ish. Um, so, yeah, uh, you know, having those connections, knowing people, checking in on folks, just seeing how they're doing. Yeah, I'll, I'll miss that um, a lot. So. Well, Harry, this has been so much fun. Um, I've been so lucky to get to work alongside you and get to know you over the years. And I, you know, I know that UMSL has been changed for the best in so many ways because of you and your work and your time here. And I'm just going to go right on ahead and speak for the entire campus when I say that we're so thankful for you, that you'll be missed so, so dearly, and that we wish you the absolute best as you embark on this next phase. Um, and in true Harry spirit, I'm not going to say goodbye, but instead I'm just going to say, see you later. And thank you, Harry, for so much. Uh, thank you for everything. So are there any last parting words you'd like to leave your UMSOL students and colleagues with? Oh, I mean, how do I follow that up? I might, we might as well just like put my voice over that and then that's good. Like everything Elizabeth said, that's fantastic. Um, no, it's, as I say, it's not goodbye. This, see you later. And it's, um, so it's been three years. It's hard to believe that it's, it's been that long uh, that I've been here. It's flown by. Granted, some would say three years just fly by, but I have to say that, um, Umzel, you do transform lives and lives are transformed by the work that we do in St. Louis and this region. And I, I think to myself about the little engine that could, and I think about Umzel and I say, it's the little school that does. Um, it does what it says it's going to do. And it's the little school that may not have the most money, you know, it may not have all the bells and whistles, but it gets the work done. It's the little school that does. And I think hold your head high, continue to do this work, um, you know, and continue to own your place in this region uh, as far as that goes. And it has been great. And it's, as Elizabeth said, it's not goodbye. It's see you later. Thank you for letting me be a part of this chapter of Unsel history. And I know there are many, many more chapters to be written. And I hope mine is not <laughs> a chapter that we will go, yeesh, but I hope it's one that you'll look back 
uh, fondly because I have enjoyed every moment here and I'm excited about the future. Well, thanks, Harry. And I guess we'll see you later. All right, folks. This is the final Rainbow Talks. Thank you for this entire series. Thank you for joining. Once again, Elizabeth, thank you for being a guest and thank you for letting me come into wherever you watch these episodes. It's been a fabulous time doing them. See you later, folks. And remember, stay safe, stay sane.